Hello Tips and Tricksters, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Vintage Tips and Tricks video. Today, following my Emily in Paris video, as promised, I'm going to be talking about how I moved to Paris. So, let's get into it. What have you got? absolutely freezing so I'm gonna be wrapping this blanket around me that does not go with my outfit what well, goes with my earrings there we go my bone crossbone earrings and I have a pretty much cold now hot chocolate so I'm ready guys I'm ready I thought I would break up this video into different sections so I'll start with what made me decide to go to the beautiful city of Paris <laughs> I have had New York, Paris and London on my bucket list for as long as I can remember. I think I probably said since I was about 14 that I wanted to live in each of those cities in my life at some point. I wasn't intending to move to Paris in 2016. I at that time had come out of a really long-term relationship and I decided that I was going to go to Montreal. This was because I had recently come back from a week-long jazz course in New York and I had made some really amazing musician friends in New York and everyone was encouraging me to go there and I thought look I have connections and it just sounded like a really exciting opportunity and I had nothing tying me in Australia anymore so I decided that I wanted to go to New York but then I looked into the visas for the US and I realized that if I wanted to go anytime soon I wasn't realistically going to be able to get an artist visa or a working visa as they were really expensive and quite difficult to get without getting a lawyer as many of my friends who had that visa or those visas told me. So I thought well why don't I get a one year working holiday visa for Canada because it's part of the Commonwealth as is Australia so I could have got a working holiday visa for there and Montreal is not, you know, super close to New York, but close enough that I could get back and forth. And also they speak French in Montreal. And I thought, well, it's an opportunity for me to check off something on my bucket list, which is to learn French in my life. So that was my plan. But a spanner got thrown in the works on New Year's Eve of 2015, 2016, when at midnight on a tram, a Frenchman walked up to me and kissed me on each cheek and wished me a happy new year. That was the moment I met Val and started a whirlwind romance for two months in Australia. And then when he left, like we knew while we were dating that he had to leave and I was planning to go to Montreal and we we're like, look, we just have to accept that, you know, we've met each other and we're lucky and we're going to have like two months together and that's that. After he went back to France and I was supposed to be getting on with saving to go to Montreal, we both realized we were really miserable without each other. <laughs> so uh, we talked a lot over the next few months and I decided that I was going to stop over on the way to Montreal for two weeks in Paris and he was going to meet me there and we were going to hang out for two weeks in Paris if he could get time off of work. But then I had a conversation with a family friend of ours, a good friend of my dad, who is also a jazz singer and had lived for many, many years in Paris. And when I was telling her, like, do you think I'm thinking of stopping over in Paris for two weeks? Do you think that's enough time or should I take a bit longer in Paris? And she's like, why are you going to Montreal? Like, why not just go to Paris? There's a guy there. If that's your excuse to go, that's fine. Don't stress about the fact that it's a guy. It's Paris. Like, if it doesn't work out with the guy, you're in Paris. <laughs> Louise Blackwell, that was a very, very sound piece of advice. <laughs> I know maybe not the smartest move to chase a guy around the world. Obviously it worked out for me because I've been in a relationship with Val for almost five years now. But, you know, lots of other people have done that and it's backfired on them. But, you know, it is a really good catalyst to get you to go and do something. So if you're going to go somewhere really amazing and it's, you know, a guy or a girl luring you there. Hey, if it makes you do something you probably wouldn't have done otherwise, then great. Go and have an adventure, that's what I say. <laughs> just make sure you have more than just that reason to stay. Like, 
Paris obviously has so many other advantages. It's one of the most amazing cities in the world. There's lots of jazz there. There's lots of other artists, lots of opportunities. It's close to London, like, and lots of other European cities. So there was a lot of reasons to move to Paris, but yes, the number one reason was a guy. <laughs> The process of saving to move for Paris was pretty crazy. <laughs> I had already been saving to move to Montreal. I hadn't saved a lot because being that it's a working holiday visa and you can get a job while you're there, uh, I didn't feel like I needed a lot of savings in order to move over there. And Australian dollars to Canadian dollars at the time was really, really good. And I'd looked at the cost of housing and things like that. And it was way more affordable than Melbourne where I was living. So uh, I wasn't particularly worried about money in terms of moving to Montreal. It was not the same moving to Paris. The visa for France was much more expensive as was the amount of money that I needed in my bank account, which was much higher. So you need a certain amount of money in your bank account to demonstrate that you can support yourself while you kind of find your feet in that new country. Uh, so yeah, I needed more money for that because of the exchange rates, obviously. Australian dollars to euros is not good as opposed to Australian dollars to Canadian dollars, which was good. So suddenly I had way more expenses on my hands, not to mention that for some reason the flight was way more expensive. I don't know if it's just because this city of Paris is like such a popular destination, but it was much more expensive for the flights. Just, yeah, everything was way more expensive. So I had that and then also obviously I was really really missing Val so instead of having the option of like oh you know I'll take 12 to 18 months to save what I need to and I'll kind of prepare to leave when I am ready I suddenly was like I want to go as soon as I can and the soonest I could realistically save the money I thought <laughs> was six months so I worked 70 to 80 hours a week every single day for six months <laughs> to save as much money as I possibly could. And I worked in promo. I haven't seen these so much in the UK, but in Australia, we have like these really cool like promotional activities um, or events where brands give stuff away or have like a pop-up bar or like VIP section and stuff like that. So I used to do promo and during this time I was the events manager for this, meaning that I was the person in charge of running the event. I was freaking exhausted, <laughs> but that's how I did it. Um, if you want something badly enough, you will make it happen. And that's how I did it. I did this job because it was really well paid. So on average, Australians make in like a full-time job with the qualifications that I had. I had a university degree, but I didn't have a ton of experience. Um, I'd worked as a retail manager. And in that kind of echelon, you can usually earn between like 17 and $21 an hour Australian. As an events manager, I could earn between 30 and 50 an hour. So that's why I chose that. And also I really like working in events. Um, I just really like the spontaneity of it and that you never know what you're gonna get. Like every day was with a different client and you have to like adapt and change really quickly. I love it. So I highly recommend doing promo work uh, in Australia if you're looking to move overseas because you can get a lot of work and uh, you can save money really quickly because it is really, really well paid. Promo is really big in the UK as well. So a lot of people from the UK work in promo in Australia, which means that you're working with people who know all about visas and travel, which is really, really helpful. So while I was at work all day long, I was also getting fantastic tips for moving overseas. So promo is a really good way of saving up for moving overseas. The other thing I had to save up for, which you kind of don't think about beforehand, but once I started getting ready and like reading all the, the tips and information for my visa and also speaking to other people who'd moved overseas and traveled a lot, was that you need to pay an entire year worth of health and travel insurance. So I was on a working holiday visa, which meant I had no recourse to public funds or healthcare. So I had to pay for that in advance for one entire year, which was almost a thousand Australian dollars just for that. So keep that in mind. If you're not on a visa where you have healthcare available to you, or you're not gonna have a social security number in the country that you're going to, you may have to pay for that stuff upfront for that entire time. So that's a really big unexpected expense. Like the expense of that was more than the visa. Not the amount that I needed to have in my bank account. I can't remember how many euros. I think at that time it was about two, 
2,800 euros or something that I had to have in my bank account and I needed a little bit of leeway in case the exchange rate changed because it needed to be that amount when I entered the country. So you're kind of guessing on that. Uh, and then the cost of the visa as well, which I think from memory was a few hundred dollars. I told you guys, gourmets always comes when I'm filming a video. She just pushed the door open directly behind the camera and here she comes. Gourmet! Hi, yeah, I know I started filming and I didn't invite you. I'm so sorry, yeah, I know. Rude, so rude, guys. If you, you're gonna have to be on camera, you can't come in and then not get in the shot. Mm. So, getting back to my story, <laughs> before I was rudely interrupted, the last factor that made it possible for me to move to Paris was just a mad scramble at the end. So, I didn't manage to save enough money, largely because I was working so much that I kept sleeping in <laughs> and missing my alarm and my car got towed twice because we lived on one of those roads where you can park overnight but at 7.30 in the morning it changes to a clearway and if you don't move your car by 7.30 within like three minutes of the changeover they will tow your car and that happened to me twice which cost me 550 Australian dollars each time so I lost $1,100 of my money for my trip to Paris to freaking tow fees. Don't do that guys. <laughs> so what I did to get that money back and also I needed a lot more money. So I sold my car, which was worth about $4,000 and I sold my piano, which I think I sold for 1500 to a friend of mine, a fellow musician. So it's in good hands. My baby is in good hands, but that was really hard to let go of. My car had been uh, inherited from my grandfather when he passed away. So that really meant a lot to me. And um, my piano, I had had, like my parents bought that for me when I was 12 or 13 I think so those were two things that I sold that really meant a lot to me but I knew I wasn't planning to come back to Australia I had spent my whole life wanting to move overseas and have a life adventure and so I thought there's no point hanging on to two things that I'm probably never going to use again or I'm only going to use very sporadically for a brief time each year so it was worth it. So yes, I sold those and then I just sold or donated everything else that I owned. A few boxes went to my parents' house, but we lived in different states. So the only things that got saved were um, a boots worth, like the back of a station wagon's worth of boxes and vintage clothes because that's all that would fit. And that's all I had time to send back with my mum. I think I sent one suitcase back with my dad because he came on a plane trip and I paid for an extra suitcase to go back with him. Basically, I just like donated everything and I've mentioned before on my social media that I gave away some stuff that I seriously regret, like an overwire 1950s spiral stitched strapless bra uh, that I just gave to an op shop. Yeah, I've not seen one in my size since. Big regret. And some other stuff that disappeared along the way that I probably accidentally donated. So yeah, be more prepared than me guys. I had a lot of stuff and so in the end it was just like dumping stuff in the bin or sending it to op shops or just giving it to my friends. So um, yeah, be prepared that like packing up your life to move permanently overseas takes way longer than you think it's going to. <laughs> I arrived on a plane <laughs> and Val picked me up from the airport. Before I left, I had arranged myself an English speaking job. I was really worried about the fact that I could not speak French at all. Like I was taking some audiobook courses. I didn't have the income to take like a French class or a course or pay for those really good quality online courses. So I just bought some audiobooks and I, when I went running every day for an hour, I would listen to the audiobook and anytime I was on the tram or the train or driving to work, just whenever I could, I was practicing. But realistically, there was no way I was going to be able to hold a proper conversation or do a job where I was required to speak French all day to clients or, you know, send emails writing in French. Like, just no. <laughs> so I was worried about that. So I decided to get an English speaking job before I went to the country. And I would have to say this is one piece of advice I would recommend you 100% do. It is really hard to get a job in France. I'm like even Val really struggles to get work. Like everyone I know 
that lives in France that doesn't have their own business between jobs. It's really, really hard to find a job. It's very competitive. Uh, bosses are like really difficult to impress. And also there's a lot of rules that are different. Like in Australia and America, when you go to an interview, you really talk yourself up and people often kind of lie a little bit about what they're capable of. And bosses want to be wowed in an interview. In France, if you behave like this, you're seen as arrogant and pompous and full of it and like not somebody they want to have on their team. So uh, that's really tricky and a big cultural difference. So I would recommend trying to get a job beforehand so that you've given yourself plenty of time leading up. And also just so that if you're arriving without a lot of money, you already know that you have a contract in place and that you're going to be able to pay for your accommodation, etc. I just really recommend getting a job before you go. The mistake that I made though was that I agreed to start work two days after I arrived in Paris. And when I agreed to that, I didn't realize I would also have to do a training the day after I arrived in Paris. So I arrived in the evening, the next morning at 9 a.m. I had to travel one hour. So actually I had to leave at 8 a.m. to travel one hour to a training that started at nine and went for several hours. And then the next day I started my job. <sighs> that did not leave me any time to recover from six months of working 70 to 80 hours a week. And it didn't allow me to recover from jet lag. And it didn't allow me to see any of Paris before I started working. So I was freaking exhausted and it took ages, I mean months before I had the energy on the weekend to go out and see Paris and enjoy Paris because I was exhausted. I got sick all the time and I wanted to sleep all the time. Plus it's a really big culture shock when you change countries. Like I didn't speak French, so I felt like super isolated and I had Val to translate for me. So if you go on your own and you don't have a French person, who's living with you and able to like translate for you and introduce you to people and things. Um, it's really emotionally exhausting. Just say it takes so much more brain power. And also when you move overseas, you kind of think everything's going to be like really exciting and amazing and great. And the reality is it's actually really, really, really hard. Don't get me wrong. It is 100% worth it, but it's not all like sunshine and rainbows. There's so much kind of positivity and growth that comes out of it, but it's really, really hard. And I did not expect that at all. And I didn't plan any kind of like buffer time for that. So I would really, really recommend giving yourself at least one to two weeks after you arrive to just get over the culture shock, get over your jet lag, settle into a routine and also go and see and discover the city that you've moved to. We didn't get an apartment straight away. One, because uh, I didn't have any kind of credit or bank account or anything other than just my work contract to uh, make me an eligible uh, tenant. <laughs> Val was new to Paris, so he didn't have any like previous tenancy evidence for Paris either. He had had one lease, I think, while he was a student in Dijon, but I, I believe the lease was under his parents' name. So we, neither of us had any rental history. And Val was leaving the job he had to come to Paris and he hadn't found a new one yet. So we just, it wasn't viable. And also we'd only known each other for like in person for two months at that point, And then six months separated by the world. So uh, we didn't want to like jump straight into getting a lease together. We wanted to like give ourselves time to get to know each other and check that this was going to work for us. And also, um, yeah, gain some credit history. So we Airbnb'd it and I would highly recommend this for anyone who's looking to travel for long periods of time or move somewhere new. Airbnb in big cities is actually surprisingly affordable because it's so competitive. Usually they give a pretty decent discount, which makes it almost the same amount as what they pay in rent uh, if you're booking a month or more at a time. So yeah, I would really recommend that. Like we were looking at places in Paris that were like 50 to 60% off for the month. So we got some really, really good deals. And for a month's rent, we were paying about 900 euro on average and our rent ended up being 840. So it was only 60 a month more than our actual rent. So highly recommend doing that while you find your feet. We actually ended up staying in Airbnbs for five months because it's quite hard to find an apartment in Paris. So yeah, Airbnb was a real blessing. If you've kind of set yourself up to stay in a hotel or something, which is really expensive, and then you're thinking you're going to find an apartment pretty quickly, probably not. Like if you get really lucky, that's amazing. And if you can get an apartment before you go, 
fantastic, but I would always personally go to a Paris apartment. That's just me, but yeah, the listings for Paris apartments are usually boring, so <laughs> definitely go and see them in person. The other big mistake that I made was that I didn't get a European card or a travel card because my job had said they would set me up with a bank appointment and they would help me with all of like the bureaucratic stuff. I was like, oh, you know, I'll go and have my bank appointment. They'll send me my card within, you know, a week, like they do in Australia. Like if you have a bank appointment, they just immediately approve you. They just want everyone to join them. They don't say no to anybody. Um, <laughs> and they just send your card out. What I didn't realize is that it's kind of like going to an interview in France. They decide whether they want you to be their client and it takes them three weeks to decide. And then it takes them forever to send you your card. And I received the card, but it took them seven months to send me my pin. I won't go into that story now because this video would be horribly long if I did, but I will make another video of my like horror experiences in Paris because that was definitely one of them. Get a travel card or a European card before you go. The other thing to keep in mind in France in terms of doing things like getting apartments and jobs is that it is really, really different to your home country. Like you might be lucky enough to be in a country where the process is pretty much the same, but I think most countries are different to France. France, anything bureaucratic is really difficult and complicated. It's kind of like the French don't want to help you. Like it's their job to help you, but they don't want to. So be prepared to wait weeks, months, whatever, to hear responses, to just take one step in the process. Like it takes Finding apartments, getting a bank account, those kind of things take a really long time and there's always like a cycle of like you need one in order to have the other one but you can't have the other one without the other one and oh yeah. And the other thing is with finding a job, unlike, again I don't know what it's like in your country, wherever you're watching from, but in Australia we appreciate something called relevant experience. That means you might be changing industries uh, or doing a job that's not technically the same as what you studied or what you've been working in, but if you can demonstrate how you have skills both professionally and personally that are relevant to your job and that you're going to do a good job in this new position, they'll give you the job <laughs> as long as you're the best candidate. Uh, it's not like that in France. If you didn't study it and you don't have experience in that job, in that industry, in that position, they don't care. They're not interested in relevant experience. You won't even get the opportunity to speak about that. Your resume can't be all like pompous and flowery and talking about how great you are. It just literally states the jobs you've had and where you studied and what you studied and it has your photo. I know, cringe, but that's what they do in France still. I feel like that went out in Australia in the 80s and it's like a massive no-no to put your photo on your resume unless you are in like the performing arts industry. So you really don't have much of an opportunity to demonstrate why you would be a good worker if you're not good on paper. So keep that in mind and to not upsell yourself in interviews. If you don't speak French, I would recommend looking for an English speaking job with an international company before you go. That's why I chose to work with Babylong. They're a company that only employs fluent English speakers to work in English teaching jobs. So essentially you are a babysitter, you work with the family, but you must speak English 24 seven with the children. You can never let the children know you're capable of speaking French if you can because it's immersion English. So the children learn English because their nanny only speaks English to them. You have activities to do as well, but part of the job is that you cannot speak French to the children. Does make it very hard to learn French. I basically learned almost no French while I lived in Paris because of this and the fact that Parisians constantly switch to English when they hear your accent. So be aware of that. But it did make the whole process of getting a job much easier. And my boss was not French, so she was much more open to my experience. I was well and truly qualified for the job, but it also helped and made the whole process much easier because to be honest, she wasn't French. And so the process was one I was familiar with. Whereas later on when I tried to find other jobs, I really struggled. In fact, I never found one. I also left the country. I'm sure I eventually would have got one, but I left and went to England. But yeah, keep in mind that the whole like job hunting thing is very, very, very different in France. <laughs> So I'm going to finish on a positive. I feel like there's a lot of like warnings in this video, but I want to say that moving to Paris is one of the best experiences I ever had in my life. I really miss Paris. I hope I can go back there one day. The difficult factors 
at the time I found really hard because I didn't speak the language and I had like culture shock and it was the first time I'd moved to a new country. But looking back, there's some of the things that made me who I am today and forced a lot of personal growth in me. And I would not undo those for the world. The culture and the history, beautiful parks, beautiful architecture. Once a month, the museums are free to attend, so you don't have to pay to go and see, you know, some of the most famous artworks in the world. There is amazing food. There's like so many people from all over the world. You can try for yourself how fantastic real French baguettes and wine and pastries are. Because <laughs> guys, honestly, until you've tried it, you just don't get it. I can't say any more to you how much I recommend the experience of moving to a big city and changing your life and just going for it. It is so worth it. Yes, it's going to be really hard, but I honestly have no regrets. Je ne regrette rien, as Yves Piaf would say. So yeah, that's it guys. That's the story of how I moved to Paris. If you guys want to see any more videos about my experience in Paris or in France, let me know. I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe and comment down below. Let me know what you thought of the video and suggestions for future videos. Come and follow me on my Instagram. Check out my Patreon. It is linked down below for extra content every month, extra tips and tricks and perks for different tiers. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.